Well, hello and welcome to yet another edition of 101, the program that not only celebrates the successes of individuals of note in our midst, but also asks those heart-hitting, probing questions you would wish to ask these individuals. I'm your host, Kadim Bireden Buruka. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our guest for this evening. That's the Chief Executive Officer of the Motor Vehicle Fund, MBA, Jerry Mwandindo Hamba. Very good evening to you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Jerry, we have uh, various to topics to cover, and uh, let's start off with your background. Jerry Mwandindo Hamba got to be very well known in this country, especially in the pre independence era, with your involvement in student politics, your days in Nanso. What can you remember about those days? Yes, I was part of a group of student leaders that decided to join the struggle in terms of resisting the military bases, the establishment of military bases at our schools in northern Namibia. As a result, Deborah was a fragile, was, was a very fragile um, site mm -hmm. to grow into student politics and we mobilized the student population to take on this plight whereby we let over 400 students in the early hours of the morning to come and destabilize all the schools in Vinduk. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of the defining moments of my leadership career. Mm -hmm. well, was it easy for the student leaders of that time, right after independence, to get into the, those opportunities, that, the educational opportunities, uh, that, that, were, you know, uh, that were something that was not allowed before independence, that those opportunities were not availed, for example? You need to understand that before independence, we had a Bantu education system. And some of us were fortunate in the sense that our parents had access to some means that enabled us to attend church schools that would be slightly private, if you would put it that way, and who had slightly better education and also much more an enabling environment for encouraging debate and as well as setting up uh, structures within those schools to advance a political agenda, more so a student political agenda. Uh, hence, opportunities were limited and finding good opportunities in whatever spheres, you had to fight for those opportunities. But you did find. How did you manage to do that? It's a matter of being at the right place at the right time and being able to see opportunities as they come forth. Mm -hmm. I understand you, you had applied to become a journalist. So uh, at that time, it appears to me that you were a very confused young man. You didn't know what you wanted to become. Was that no. the case? No, at the time when I finished... Uh, secondary school, I had the opportunity to be awarded at least two bursaries. One was from NBC and one was from the Council of Churches. And I simply had to make a choice. I did come to the NBC for the interview for a journalist uh, scholarship and I successfully uh, was awarded the scholarship but unfortunately as opportunities present, I had to choose another option. Mm -hmm which was the Council of Churches Scholarship, to pursue something else. So after that, you, you went to study, you went to several countries, Bangladesh, you were in the U.S., you were in the U.K., you were developing yourself. When you came back into the country, what did you do then? My academic training um, cemented itself through both work and study. And I landed my first job in Oshakati through an NGO called Namibia Development Trust. Prior to that though, whilst at university at the academy then, one of the holidays I was able to access an opportunity at the US Peace Corps where I happened to be one of the trainers of Peace Corps volunteers coming into Namibia. Um, but otherwise, I started off with the Namibia Development Trust, did extensive development work with community groups uh, addressing issues of poverty, income generating activities for women, uh, as well as creating new opportunities for people uh, who were in abject poverty. Mm -hmm. So 
you went to the Social Security Commission at a time that the commission was in its infant stages, appointed development uh, manager, I, I, I believe. What, development fund manager, what was your role there? In essence, it was, I was appointed as the, man, the first manager for the development fund. The Social Security Act provides that it would establish such a fund, and for many years it has not done so. They were looking for someone who could put together the operational framework for which I was hired. We consulted extensively throughout the country, uh, through all stakeholders of Social Security, and we presented a concept to the board which was approved, and it only required further approval by cabinet. Um, in essence, the development fund is provided for in the enabling legislation to create employment, to support training schemes, employment schemes, bursaries, and so forth. And funds were available to do so. And I was hired for that, set it up competently, and I then left. Mm -hmm. But the management of, 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 of your era, of, of your time at the Social Security Commission, uh, was blamed for the bad decisions that they took, especially investment decisions uh, that the Social Security uh, Commission took at the time. Do you share the blame? for some of those bad decisions? Well, I think it's important to understand that there are management decisions and there are individual decisions. At that point in time, my role was to set up a development fund. But you were there for two years and a half. Were you I was party not, to those decisions, I was not those part, bad investment decisions? I do not recall any bad investment decisions during my tenure at the Social Security Commission. That you were involved in or that the management shared the blame as, as a corporate both, body? Both. Um, there is an investment committee of the board. There is a board that decides and then the minister approves the investments. Under uh, no instances was I a member of any of those structures. I was simply a senior manager hired to set up the development fund, make it operational, and I did not take part in investment decisions. And in any case, the, I believe the investment decisions that was published in the newspapers, most of those occurred after my departure. But there was lavish spending at the Social Security Commission at the time. We remember an incident where a pen was bought for 7,000 Namibian dollars. You were part of that management, weren't you? No. I believe those pens were bought before my time. And whether it's lavish or not, it's a judgment call. And I think any of us are given a responsibility to decide on what must be bought, what should not be bought. Whether it's lavish, it's in the eye of whoever thinks it's lavish. Buying a pen for Social Security Commission uh, with the intention of providing it as a gift or as whatever the intention was, I think should be justified by whoever did it. So would you find something like that? to be in bad taste, to not sit well with taxpayers, for example? I think I'm not the appropriate person to pass judgment on such a buy or such ex an expenditure. Um, I think we need to understand that when you are CEO or you're in management, yes, you are given a responsibility to govern or to lead. Um, within the framework that you are provided for. But in the larger context of things, if you are managing a $2 billion fund, which is Social Security in this instance, for example, and buying a 7,000 pen or a gift equivalent to 7,000 or 20,000, if people must put things in context. But at that time, things like the Depo Development Fund, from where, where you were appointed to set up this particular fund to benefit the unemployed of this country, uh, had not even taken shape. Things like the Pension Fund that has been talked for years had not taken shape. How do you go about saying that we can buy a $7,000 yeah. pen while the mandate of the Social Security Commission is not even uh, taking shape yet? Look, it's important that we understand that there is a distinction between setting up a national fund, a pension fund. It takes much more effort. It takes serious planning. It takes actuarial valuations, projections to set it up. I'm not, I'm not going to defend 
what social security could not do. And I don't even think they have done it to date. I've been six years gone from the Social Security Commission. Um, but I still think the context in which any gift is procured and passed on to anyone is, must be governed within a policy framework. If Social Security had a policy to acquire corporate gifts and pass them on to anyone, then if it's done within that context of that policy, then it should be justified. Mm -hmm. So you get appointed as MVA CEO, an institution that was uh, never, uh, it never existed. What did you bring on the table? What did, why did the appointing authority uh, see it fit to appoint Jerry Mwandino Hamba? Somebody that was involved in the Social Security Commission, a body at the time that people said had failed. Well, in defense of the Social Security Commission, I don't think it has failed. It continues to provide much-needed services. But we know the bad 